Uh, hey everybody, I think we'll go ahead and get started a couple minutes early since we seem to have a full house. Um, for me, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Roberts uh, to all of you. Um, I've been following his work for a long time and he works in an area that's uh, very close to my heart and looking at um, various chromatin remodelers in uh, pediatric uh, tumors and particularly pediatric brain tumors. Um, I was going through CEV to try to describe all of his many, many, many accomplishments, but I think the one that struck me the most was the fact that most recently he had two papers in Nature Genetics back to back in the same issue. And so to me, that's now my new gold standard for trying to get to that someday in my life of, as a scientist. Um, so I'll introduce Dr. Roberts. Thanks, Rajiv. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Okay in the back? Good. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's felt like a big hole in my experience that I've never been here. I've been skiing at many of the resorts in Colorado but and to uh, AACR in Denver. So I saw your convention center a number of years ago. But finally getting onto campus is, is really nice for me and a great experience to see just how big it is and impressive. Um, let me just first start with no disclosures. Um, so, as Rajiv mentioned, my lab is really interested in understanding the relationships between chromatin remodeling, transcriptional regulation, and cancer, and in particular focused on the switch SNF or BAF chromatin remodeling complex. And we got interested in this a number of years ago when I was starting my postdoc in Stu Orkin's lab when Olivia Delatra had just reported at that point that there were biallelic inactivating mutations in a core subunit of the switch SNF complex called SNF5 or smark b one at that time. And that caught my interest for a couple of reasons. First, it was the first known link between ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling and cancer. So therefore, maybe new ways to think about mechanisms that underlie cancer, maybe new opportunities to think about therapeutic approaches. But it was also of interest because I think history has taught us that the genes that are mutated in the earliest onset pediatric cancers are often of broad relevance to cancer in general. So if we think about retinoblastoma, it's a rare pediatric cancer of the eye, but study of that disease not only highlighted retinoblastoma gene family and its importance in cancer quite broadly, but also more fundamental lessons about tumor suppressors in general. Uh, and so we decided to begin working on this disease. And so you know, what was this disease that caught our interest? So rhabdoid tumors or malignant rhabdoid tumors or ATRT as they're called in the brain are rare but highly aggressive cancers of early childhood. They occur in kidney, brain, soft tissues throughout the body. They're quite lethal and the vast majority of kids die of their disease most within a year of diagnosis. Some high intensity chemotherapy is beginning to have some dents. There are, like retinoblastoma, familial cases that are consistent with the rhabdoid predisposition syndrome. And then ultimately, there turns out to be biallelic loss uh, mutations in the, one of the genes with the most horrendous nomenclature out there. There are four different names, all of which are in use in the literature. Um, you'll hear, I used to use SNF5. I'm trying to move to the Hugo use of smark b one but INI1 and BAF47 are, are also used. Now, this complex was known prior to its link to cancer. It's evolutionarily conserved from yeast. Shown here are the mammalian versions. And what I'd like to point out is in green are com or subunits that we think of as being core subunits that are generally present in most or all variants of the complex. But important to point out that there are variable subunits. For instance, the BAF45 subunit, four different genes, A, B, C, D, BAF 60, three different genes, A, B, C, each a little bit different, BAF 53, A and B. ATPA subunit, two different versions. You've got ARID1, A, B, and then this can be swapped out for PBAF. And so there are at least theoretically over a thousand different combinations that are possible. And in any individual cell, there are mutually exclusive subunits that are expressed. And so here I think a little bit about TV monitors or video screens that have only four real colors, but depending on how you combine them, our eye can see you know, 16,000 different colors. And so 
while every cell has the same core motor, the diversity that are encoded by these complexes may be quite remarkable. What we know about the biochemical activity um, really hasn't been very clear. People like Weedong Wang, Jerry Crabtree, Blaine Bartholomew, Bob Kingston have shown in vitro that these complexes can bind to nucleosomes and slide or eject them from chromatin. But really what's happening in the three-dimensional nucleus uh, with chromatin is, is unclear. So I mentioned, you know, this link to this pediatric cancer. We began wanting to know, is this in fact a tumor suppressor? Can we generate models? Heterozygous mice, um, homozygous inactivation led to early embryonic lethality. Heterozygous mice were cancer prone, developing rhabdoid tumors. And when we went to a conditional model to turn off the, the gene, let the mice be born, this is what we see. And 100% uh, of the mice develop cancer, and the median onset is only 11 weeks. So that is remarkably rapid for turning off a single gene. It takes half the time that p53 loss takes. And even the combination of p53 and RB, p53 deficiency with RB haploinsufficiency is about 18 weeks. And so the 11-week median onset with 100% penetrance really suggested a, a potent role in tumor suppression. Now, I said, you know, we first got into this wondering whether there would be broader relevance to cancer in the first few years, it wasn't clear that that was going to be the case, but then really in 2010, the floodgates opened. And so here was the, the Delatra paper that caught my interest. There was one other little hint from Ramon Parsons' group in 2008. And then in 2010, with the finding that the ARID1A subunit is mutant in 50% of ovarian clear cell carcinomas, then the PBRM1 subunit, about 35% of uh, renal carcinomas, mutations in bladder cancer, ARID2 and hepatocellular cancer, gastric cancer, and I basically sort of stopped collecting. There's pediatric cancers here, adult cancers, um, Burkitt's. You get the idea. Um, interesting, uh, nice paper here in synovial sarcoma showing a fusion gene. Um, and in total, work by Seagal showing that now over 20% of all human cancers contain a mutation in the SWITCHNIF subunit. Nine different SWITCHNIF genes were currently mutated in cancer. Uh, I, this one I point out, it's a nice paper by Wei Su that is covalent modification of the, the complex being linked to cancer. So 20% genetic mutations or 20 to 25%, whether post-translational modifications are adding to that or not is, is a possibility. And so what this really then says is the SWITCHNIF or BAF chromatin remodeling complex has emerged as a major tumor suppressor. And, you know, a few years ago with the, the human cancer genome sequencing, uh, you know, Bert Vogelstein got up and said, we really didn't learn that much because we knew about the important genes, the MYC, the RAS, the P53s, and we sort of refined them. And then a year or two later, that changed really with the recognition that the chromatin modifiers hadn't really been fully appreciated. Uh, and so while we've been studying most major tumor suppressors and oncogenes for decades, the mix, the RAS, is the P53s. This one is, is a very frequent mutator, and we've, it's really only recently become moved to the forefront in terms of understanding it. And so in my lab, one of the first questions that we were asking is, you know, what is the mechanism by which SMARC-B1 loss drives cancer? Is it genetic or transcriptional? And at that point, we were thinking, you know, 100% cancer onset that fast, this must be really scrambling the genome and, and leading to uh, mutations and tumor onset. Uh, we looked then at DNA damage. We actually didn't see something very strong in here, so I'm just showing the, the genomic landscape of SMARC-B1 mutant cancers. And so here's what normal cells look like. Here's tumors. You see that, you know, here's a, uh, a tumor that has an amplification and deletion. But by and large, what you see is that these are diploid tumors with remarkably simple genomes, unless you go to 22Q11, where SMARC-B1 is located. And if you go in there, you can see that there's loss of it, anything from whole chromosome arm loss down to intragenic point mutations. So that was, you know, diploid cancers. Well, what about sequencing them? And so here we collaborated with the Broad Institute, and um, this slide's now getting a little bit old, but uh, at that point, the rhabdoid tumors had the lowest mutation rate that had ever been detected in a cancer at the Broad. At that point, it was only about 3,000 exomes. Um, so this is the logarithmic scale, the mutational load. 
uh, there was four non-silent mutations per exome here, and the only gene that was recurrently mutated that we could find was SMARC B1. Um, others, uh, Annie Huang and uh, the group and in Heidelberg has, have, Stefan Pfister, have subsequently added now hundreds of, of cases, and it essentially remains that SMARC B1 is, is the gene in about 15% of cases, you can pick up something else going on, but in 80 to 85%, it seems to be that genetic mutation. And really, you know, what comes out of this, these are the cancers that I learned about in grad school, melanomas and lung cancers, very, very high mutation rate, but it really turns out that these are tumors and tissues that are exposed to the environment. You can even see the UV signature in melanoma. And adult cancers that are not exposed to the environment have almost a, a log fold lower, and the pediatric ones start to get mixed in. And so, maybe some genomes can actually be quite a bit more simple than, than certainly I was, was taught about in grad school. And so what accounts for the extreme paucity of mutations? Particularly when we think about this, Bob Weinberg's lab had done experiments a number of years ago that concluded that you needed a minimum of five mutations to get cancer. Bert Vogelstein's group did some calculations, mathematical calculations, and said, yep, that's about right, you know, anything less, and we all should have had cancer long ago. So, you know, really, what's, what's going on? What gives? And so one possibility is mutations outside the exome. Um, and this remains a very important thing. You know, we really did exome sequencing. We did a little bit of whole genome sequencing, but that's a big sandbox to really rule that out. And yet, we're getting incredibly fast cancer onset with very low mutation rates. And so it's a little bit hard to understand how that's going to happen so fast. Germline events are always possible. In fact, smart B1 loss itself can be germline in about 20, 25% of cases. I don't think it's a big modifier, though, because the familial cases that are out there tend to follow a Mendelian inheritance, and we've put this into multiple different mouse backgrounds, and they seem to behave uh, the same. But one that I think it really is important to think about is developmental stage or epigenetic state, which are really kind of just different words for saying cell of origin. You know, epigenetic state is, is really cool right now. Cell of origin we've been thinking about for decades. But so let's, let's think about that. And so we took our, let's see, here's the SNF5 instead of smart b one um, We took our conditional mice and began to dissect. And so um, these mice get lymphomas as well as, as rhabdoid tumors, CD8 uh, lymphomas. And so we used Cree technology to inactivate in common lymphocyte progenitor, B and T, inactivate early T cell development, and inactiv inactivate in more mature T cells. And what we found was that SMARC B1 deficient lymphomas arise exclusively from CD8 positive T cells. And in fact, they're actually a very specific subset of long-lived memory CD8 positive T cells. And so here, I think the corollary is actually more important, and that is that Immature CD8 cells didn't transform. CD4 memory cells don't transform. Thymocytes, mice get thymomas all the time. They never, these mice never get these type of lymphomas. And the B lineage, totally fine. We never saw um, tumors there. And so we get incredibly rapid cancer onset, really simple genomes, but the cell of origin, the developmental stage, the epigenetic state is incredibly specific. And so if we back up, you know, Bob Weinberg, when, when Bill Hahn, when they were doing those, they were taking a fibroblast. And it did take five mutations to get a fibroblast to turn into cancer. Maybe that's not such a relevant cell type for cancer. And the Vogelstein calculations were based on the assumption that every cell in the body was equally susceptible to transformation. And I think now we know that that's really not the case. And so if it is exquisitely specific cell types that are, sens that are sensitive and maybe even temporally sensitive, uh, then the number of the mutations that are required may be quite a bit lower than what we've been, been thinking about and start to get into how we're getting such simple cancers when chromatin regulators are perturbed. Now, I want to just add one thing for um, a paper that was actually just finally accepted about 40 minutes ago. Um, this is actually from Alex Kensis's lab. My lab is a collaborator on this, but this is really, you know, I'm sort of like a little collaborator on this. This is really Alex's work. Um, he got interested when he was studying rhabdoid tumors about transposable elements and was looking at the piggyback um, uh, transposable element family and finding that it was reasonably highly expressed in pediatric tumors. Now, it's also expressed in normal tissues, and so I, I think this is... 
um, interesting to, to think about, but Alex's group has shown that if you overexpress uh, this piggyback transposable element, you can actually drive tumor onset in mice. And so what this was looking at was, in some cases, they seem to see that perhaps SMARC-B1 could have been inactivated by a piggyback transposable element jumping. And so, you know, this is brand new stuff. I'm not good at the comp bio myself, but I think it's really important to get out there and see whether um, some other things are being looked at. Often transposable elements are masked out from sequencing because they're repetitive elements. And so I think that'll be a cool topic to, to look at. Um, but ultimately, the, oncogenesis, the oncogenic drive caused by SMARC-B1 loss, regardless of how it is lost, we think maybe largely transcriptional in nature. And maybe this shouldn't be so surprising. If we really think about, you know, normal development, radically different cell fates that are encoded by the chromatin or epigenome. We think of, you know, neurons that are a meter long and don't divide for a decade compared to an activated lymphocyte, a small round blue cell dividing every six hours, have essentially identical DNA content. And so is perturbing these chromatin regulators beginning to alter this fate control? And so um, I want to push pause there and go forward and, and show you some of our data. But I also think that this begins to have some implications for therapy. So we've been using these pediatric models, but they also seem to be informing us about the Zelt disease because these um, tumor suppressors are widely mutated. And so... You know, the model that a lot of us are certainly in my training and got excited about were things like, let's find the activated oncogene, understand it, drug it, and we can, we can turn this cancer around. But what about in rhabdoid tumors? That the only recurrent mutation is a gene that's missing. So how do you drug that? And if this is, you know, a mechanism that's being shared across lots of cancers, Okay, that starts to require a paradigm shift in terms of thinking about how do we go after these things, and if they really are fundamentally underlying cancer initiation, how do we think about it? And so I want, I want to walk you through a couple of stories that we have been, um, that we've worked on. Some of them have, have been published, and, and I want to move to some newer things. But one of the first questions that really came to us, okay, if we're talking about chromatin, we're not talking about a scrambled genome here, what are the mechanisms that are underlying this? And so here, as we were puzzling over this a number of years ago, really went back to the Drosophila literature. Uh, and in the 1990s, people that were working on polycomb mutations in flies um, did genetic screens. And polycomb mutations lead to potter, you know, uh, body patterning defects, you know, too many antennae, too many wings, not enough wings, legs abnormal. And they did, geneticists did screens and said, you know, what suppresses a polycomb mutation? And what they um, came out with was switch NIF mutations. And so we asked at that point, you know, is this relevant to mammalian biology? Is it relevant to cancer? And so what we found, and this is published, but, I, but it's an important um, foundation I want to build on, was what we called epigenetic antagonism between SMARC-B1 and EZH2, which is really between the switch NIF complex and the polycomb repressive complex. We found antagonistic effects between EZH2 and SMARC-B1 at polycomb targets. We found that SMARC-B1 inactivation led to increased levels of H3K27 trimethylation, which is the mark that EZH2 writes, and increased EZH2 itself, and that loss of SMARC-B1 led to repression of these sites and activation of lineage-specific programs. Um, we asked, is this relevant in vivo? And so here we use true genetic models to inactivate EZH2. Here's the 11-week median onset. If we add in EZH2, we now completely block the tumors. Now, it's important to note the cells are still there. Those CD8 T cells are still there. They're simply not transforming. And it, it was important control that if you take EZH2 and knock it into osteosarcoma models or prostate models that also have high levels of EZH2, no effect on those. It was really blocking the, the SMARC-B1. And so we put forward then this model of antagonism saying that, you know, loss of SNF5 or SMARC-B1 led to imbalance in control of polycomb targets, a loss of control of uh, you know, the ability to execute lineage specification programs and underlied oncogenic transformation. And we put forth at that point, you know, maybe EZH2 inhibition would be a good way to go in thinking about this, or it should at least be explored. Um, 
And, and so we put forth that question. Um, Rajiv's group really picked up on this very nicely and showed that in ATR T cells, these atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors of the brain, that EZH2 inhibition indeed had strong negative effects in these cells. Um, Epizyme then came out and you know, went in vivo in their preclinical models and showed indeed that they were seeing responses. Um, into a phase one that's been done in Europe, and it's always you know, very difficult to know what to make of a phase one. It caught my intrigue when they had an adult, and it's always a little bit hard to know what an adult with rhabdoid tumor is, but in the solid tumor arm was the one that responded and went PET negative, and this patient last I knew about six months ago, two years of, of monotherapy without um, any recurrence. Um, I'll push pause there. Epizyme has updated some, and I'll, I'll return back to that. Um, but it was at least intriguing to begin thinking about. And so it was at this point that we began thinking about, is there a broader relationship between EZH2 that could extend to other switch NIF mutant cancers, and what activity of EZH2 underlies the dependence? And so what we found was that in switch NIF wild type cells, knocking down EZH2 um, really had no effect, but whether we were looking in um, the SMARK A4 mutant, the ARID1A mutant, PBRM1 mutant, um, in, in many of the cases, really a strong negative effect. Um, we then went to a genome-wide screen in collaboration with the Broad Institute to try and understand these vulnerabilities. And this, at this point, was shRNA. Uh, and, and so I think this shows some of the variability. These are the gain-of-function EZH2, and you see that in these waterfall plots, um, there's some noise in here. Um, it picks up better with the, the SUS-12 here. But in general, you see a dependence. And here are the, the switch NIF mutant cancers. And so we see you know, significant shift to the left in dependence, although a number of resistant cell lines as well. Some of that resistance is accounted for by RAS mutation, we think. Karen Tchaikovsky's lab had previously published that loss of EZH2 in a RAS mutant setting can actually accelerate tumor onset. And we saw the same thing in um, the Achilles data set with actually enrichment over here of EZH2 loss. But when we um, take out the EZH2 mutant tumors now, we see less of a resistant phenotype and a, and a stronger uh, dependence. I think there's still clearly going to be resistance, um, but thinking about dependencies there. We also spent some time thinking about what are the effects of small molecule inhibition, and we got intrigued because we saw that not all of the cell lines, you know, so cell lines that were dependent upon EZH2 were also dependent on the inhibitor, but here's a negative control, but, but some of the ones that were dependent on the uh, shRNAs were independent of the small molecule, at least by, by a log fold, and a finding that, you know, here's EZH2 knockdown. We could rescue with EZH2. We could actually partially rescue with a delta set domain that's missing a big chunk of EZH2, and later went on to use a point mutant, and in some of the cases, we could rescue. And so there are clearly enzymatic roles for EZH2, but this data began to, began to identify what we think are some non-enzymatic roles for EZH2. And then, you know, do these hold up in vivo? Yes, in as much as taking a cell line in the lab and injecting it into mice and getting the same behavior back tells you about in vivo. So there's caveats there as to that, but what we saw was the resistant cell lines remained resistant, um, but with single, with, uh, single agent treatment in vivo, we could completely block the growth of these cancers. Um, I just want to point out some, you know, so um, we had done this, and I just want to point out some, some nice work from Sadal Kadoshis and Jerry Crabtree that came out in, in Nature Genetics this year, which was using an elegant system, and again, um, reinforced what we had found, but now they invented or developed a system where with um, addition of rapamycin, you can recruit the switch NIF complex to a single locus, the OCT4 um, or PAO locus in vivo with GFP, and now study what happens when you inducibly recruit a single complex. And what they find is that um, EZH2 is very rapidly displaced. Here, as you see, time in minutes. And so within a few minutes, EZH2 is, is displaced, K27 trimethylation. Interestingly, PRC1 goes away even faster. And so uh, when you look at this and you knock out SMARC B1, 
uh, here's the antagonism, you now lose it. And so precisely what we had shown, and in fact, so it's become very clear that there is antagonistic roles between SwitchNIF and PRC2. And the question is, to what degree does this have a bearing on disease, and to what degree can this be ex um, exploited therapeutically? Um, so SwitchNIF and PRC2 or EZH2 serve antagonistic roles in regulation of target genes. Shared dependency of cancers with genetic alterations in SwitchNIF uh, subunits, at least to some degree. RAS mutations seem to lead or facilitate um, EZH2 uh, resistance. So it's not perfect, it's just a tendency. And the catalytic activity of EZH2 may be only partially responsible for the dependence. And so here's the um, update that I've had from Epizyme. You'll see it's not terribly recent, but what they found in their patients with solid tumors is that the SMARC-B1 and SMARC-A4 seem to be dependent. They also made a little bit of a mistake in their planning. Seagal had published a cell paper on synovial sarcoma showing that its mechanism was displacement of SMARC-B1. Epizyme then went after synovial sarcoma. Seagal went on later to show that it's actually not really that mechanism, and it's a gain of function with respect to EZH2. It hyperdisplaces, um, and so there's going to be some caution in terms of that group and, and what's being looked at. So what's going on? So now if we're talking about chromatin and we're talking about antagonism with PRC2 complexes, what's really happening at the level of chromatin? And why is this about cancer, especially when we're talking about complexes that are very widely expressed and active at a number of genes? Um, and so these are, uh, I'm going to show you three new publications. We have this one um, from Barack in collaboration with Peter Park. Kimberly came into my lab that was uh, Nature, Genet uh, Nature Communications and uh, Shafong, um, our first Nature Genetics paper that I want to talk about that's focused on the SMARC-B1. I'll later go to a, another paper we have that's on the ARID1A subunit. But as I was saying to Kimberly as she was beginning in work in the lab, well, okay, we're seeing this K27 trimethyl change with polycomb. What's going on? Let's also check at what's happening with K27 to settle, another mark that's there. Um, and interestingly, as we looked at this, um, and now there's control without Cree and with Cree back then, when we inactivated, whether it be the ARID1A subunit, the SMARC-A4 subunit, the SMARC-B1 subunit, what we saw was a marked reduction of K27 acetyl. In fact, much stronger phenotype even than the K27 trimethyl. Here's the EZH2 control. And this is at the level of, of Western blot for, you know, from nuclear extract. And so, you know, what's going on? So we decided to begin with our rhabdoid model system. And I want to point out, um, here's the SNF5 or SMARC-B1 subunit that is essentially present in all variants of this complex. And so as I walk you through rhabdoid tumors in this model system, here we're knocking out a core subunit. I'm going to contrast that later with the ARID1A subunit that's only in some of the complexes. And now we began to ask questions you know, about assays that we could run. What happens when you get rid of, of SMARC-B1 um, with things that we can check? So what happens to complex integrity? Well, here's rhabdo, you know, here's with SMARC-B1 replete, and you see the two megadalton complex intact. Without SMARC-B1, there's a marked reduction. So the complex is destabilized. There is an essential residual complex. We've shown that the residual complex is actually essential for the cancer phenotype. If you knock out the residual complex, the cancer cells die. And I'm not going to take time to, to show you that today. We've had a couple of publications on this, but it's an interesting way to think about, in some ways, is the residual complex oncogenic. Um, what happens to switch NIF complex targeting? And so this, I think, is, is pretty interesting. And so, you know, when I was training in grad school, it was really all about promoters. You know, promoters are what control genes and transcription, and so we were very interested in it. But over time, and particularly recently, it's really become clear that enhancers are where fine-tuning of gene expression occurs, and that promoters are not quite um, locked in a state, but they're much more steady state than enhancers. And so if you look at, at mouse brain and limb buds or in Drosophila development, it turns out that it's the switch of enhancers that control the promoters are on all the time, and it's really the enhancers that where the specificity comes from. Uh, and the reason that enhancers are just really beginning to be understood is promoters are easily defined by DNA sequence. So you can recognize them, and so we've known about promoters for decades. 
enhancers are cell context specific. You need to be able to do chip seq to understand them. And so this understanding is really just relatively new. And so when we say, where does the SwitchNIF complex bind? In fact, it's been characterized as binding at promoters, and we have even studied it there as well. But it turns out that's really not what the SwitchNIF complex seems to be about. So here's, um, without SMARC-B1, this is TSS proximal, this is promoters in dark. These other marks in lighter purple are the enhancer marks. And anything that's not enhancer or promoter is tiny here in gray. And when we add SMARC-B1 back, what we see is essentially no change at promoters and a big increase of binding of the complex at enhancers. And so what this data really then begins to, to raise the possibility of, and I'll show you more data here, is that this complex is really binding at these sites, these enhancer sites that are important for controlling cell fate. So let's take a look at the data. So the first question is what happens to the binding of the rest of the SwitchNIF complex with and without SMARC-B1? So here is um, uh, binding of the, the rest of the switch, and if we use a couple different subunits. And if we look at promoters, either without or with smart v one there's really no change. There's a small amount of the complex bound at promoters. It's there, it's real. But it's at enhancers, these TSS distal sites, where we see the dramatic effect of smart v one And so this is really where the control is happening at enhancers. So... That brings up the question then, well, what's the contribution of smart b one to the chromatin landscape at enhancers? I'm now showing you that it's important for binding of this complex there. Well, what's happening? So again, if we look at promoters or enhancers, this is now K27 acetyl. This is a mark of active enhancers. It's the chromatin mark that's there. If we look at promoters, very little change in K27 acetyl with and without um, smart b one but again, at enhancers, the absence of smart b one leads to a marked reduction in both switch NIF binding and K27 acetyl. So what does that look like? Well, it looks here. So here's the smart c one and smart a 4 the CHIP-seq subunits that we use at enhancers, and you see that there's, again, a big drop-off when smart b one is gone. Here's the promoter mark, very little change. But if we're looking at either K27 acetyl or K4 mono, which is another mark at enhancers, what we see is a substantial decrease. And also an interesting clue is that there's a bimodal distribution here, a nucleosome-free region at the enhancer when the switch NIF complex is wild type. When smart b one is mutant, you lose that nucleosome-free region. And so essentially that nucleosome-free region is where transcription factors go to bind to control cell fate. And so what we think the model is happening here is that switch NIF is essentially required for controlling and for facilitating this open nucleosome free region at enhancers to enable transcription factors to work. And in the absence, that is being lost. So how is this happening? Um, let me just point out, you know, K27 acetyl, the switch NIF complex itself does not have acetyl transferase activity. So what's going on? It doesn't have methyl transferase or demethylase activity either. Um, so what's going on? And so what we found is something that actually had been reported a number of years ago, and that is that P300 co-IPs with the switch NIF complex. And in fact, this interaction is dependent upon SMARC-A4. So here's the interaction between, um, if you IP SMARC-C1, BAF-155, it pulls down P300, you get rid of SMARC-A4, and that interaction is lost. And in fact, if we IP the switch NIF complex and throw it into a methyl transferase, a, a acetyl transferase activity, it actually pulls down the acetyl transferase activity. Again, not intrinsic to the complex, but its friends are, are bringing along that activity. And so if we look at what happens to the enhancer landscape when you turn smart b one on, so here comes smart b one we're turning this on in either a G401 or an ATRT, two different rhabdoid tumor cell lines. smart b one comes on, so does mediator, uh, another effect at um, enhancer. So does BRD4 that uh, Jay Bradner and Rick Young have really highlighted as an important uh, regulator. CBP, K27 acetyl coming on. Not so much change in K4 mono here. And it's important to note, it's not change of acetylation overall. It's really K27 acetyl that is changing. What genes are affected? What, if we say what genes are linked to the affected enhancers, what we really see is development, differentiation, morphogenesis. And I'll, I'll return to this. Um, but if we also look at either SMARC-B1 or SMARC-A4 depletion, 
again, what we're really seeing is development and differentiation um, with either SMARC B1 or SMARC A4 loss. These are the pathways that we are seeing. If we take a look at what transcription factors or what motifs are there, what we really see is developmentally regulated transcription factors, AP1 and ETS, are very strongly enriched. But you know, I want to point out that these things are having broad effects on transcription, uh, on enhancers. I don't want to give you the, the understanding that it's going to you know, six enhancers and turning them off. This is a very broad effect. So CTCF sites are depleted relatively and you know, quite statistically significant. So things that are more static, much less affected. And what's really being affected the, the greatest is things that are dynamically regulated. So what I think now becomes an important question is thinking about, are the effects of SMARC-B1 and SNF5 loss similar or distinct at super enhancers compared to typical enhancers? So why do I ask that? So now, a number of years ago, in a beautiful cell paper, um, Rick Young's lab was looking at what they called super enhancers. And so here are promoters. This is the amount of mediator um, you know, if you're looking at whatever, how many are here? I can't see, 6,000, whatever, 7,000 promoters. This is the amount of mediator that's bound at promoters. It's basically static and the same. You do see a couple promoters that have a little bit more. But if you look at enhancers, you see something very different. The large majority of enhancers have about the same amount of mediator, but then there are some where that area is just really coated with um, mediator and K27 acetyl. And it turns out the model that's gotten put forth is that these are really the transcription factors and the enhancers that are involved in locking in the current cell state. This is about the transcription factor network that underlies current cell state, whether that be an embryonic stem cell or whether that be a cancer cell that's locked in MYC with transcription factors in very high levels. And so, you know, this was of interest because Jay and Rick were trying to understand what, you know, BRD4 is bound every, you know, really widely. How can something like JQ1 that many people have heard about have specific effects? Why would that ever be something worth thinking about in anti-cancer? And so here's the story that, that they really put forward. When you looked at the BRD4 binding at typical enhancers, this is what it was. It was you know, a very long and sort of complex structure got built up at super enhancers that were driving high-level transcription. And what they found was when BRD4 was inhibited, it was really sort of a house of cards and these super enhancer structures really fell apart. And the regular enhancer, typical enhancers weren't nearly as much affected. And so what the model became then, well, oncogenes have in many cases co-opted super enhancers. And so by inhibiting BRD4, you can dissolve these super enhancers and, and block cancer phenotype. And so our question then, here's in multiple myeloma, our question became, aha, is this what's going on with the switch NIF complex? And so we took a look. And what we found was the complete opposite. And so if we take a look at, these are TSS distal outside of super enhancers. So these are typical enhancers. Now when we knock out SMARC B1, marked reduction of um, switch NIF chip enrichment. But if we look at super enhancers, very little effect. And in fact, here's super enhancer characterization. You can see some decrease of switch NIF binding at super enhancers. It's just not nearly the degree to which we see the change at typical enhancers. And here's the effect on K27 acetylation. Can't see any change in the total amount or the nucleosome free region, and the same for K4 mono. And so the super enhancers remain largely unaffected while the typical enhancers are being dramatically affected. So the Young and Bradner model is that super enhancers are really about cell fate. And so are they, in fact, essential for the rhabdoid cancer phenotype? And the answer is yes. As we knock out or knock down any of the genes associated with these super enhancers, the cells can't grow. And so these cancers are remain addicted to their super enhancers. Um, and so I'm going to push pause on that story and tell you about another subunit and then bring it back um, to, a, to a closing model. But this is um, our other Nature Genetics paper. Now we were looking at the ARID1A subunit led by just a remarkably talented grad student, uh, Radhika. And so as I mentioned, ARID1A uh, subunit is only found in the BAF subfamily of complexes. 
And so we went back and did what we'd done with smart b one We used the MX Cree transgene to inactivate it and ask what happens. And so here's what we see what happens. Now, 11 weeks is somewhere back here. So this is the smart b one cancer, cancer onset. Here's what happens with ARID1A inactivation. It takes quite a bit longer, but these mice also develop aggressive cancers. And when we take a look, uh, they are getting invasive, aggressive, nasty colon cancers. And so here's a mouse with three different colon cancers. Um, so we walked across to Brigham and Women's and talked to the colon cancer pathologist there. This is the real deal. These are colon adenocarcinomas that are invasive. Interestingly, the, the current model that's often used for colon cancers, APC-min, beta-catenin, those mice get a whole lot of small intestinal adenomas, and then you wait, and they will eventually get colon cancer carcinomas. Uh, so we have never seen a small intestinal tumor in the ARID1A mice. Uh, they just, in the GI tract, get these invasive uh, carcinomas that are ARID1A deficient. So here we begin thinking about this. You know, aberrant regulation of Wnt beta catenin signaling is, is one of the major causes of colorectal cancer. Um, APC min model drives intestinal tumors in mice via Wnt beta catenin, and so we wanted to know does does ARID1A loss accelerate tumor onset in the APC min model? Or could it be redundant with APC min? And so what we did was cross these mice together. Here's a, here are the adenomas that occur in the APC min mice. You see, when we make them double conditional, we actually markedly block the onset of adenomas that are caused by APC min. And in fact, when we look at the adenomas that are formed, they're formed exclusively by cells that have failed to delete ARID1A. So these remain ARID1A wild type. And so ARID1A is essential for the, adeno the adenomas that are caused by APC-MIN. And what we get are still the carcinoma, the adenocarcinomas that are caused by ARID1A loss. And so this is interesting because the ARID1A is found uh, most commonly in the MSI unstable colon cancers that generally do not have beta-catenin uh, went beta catenin mutations. And so we think we're looking at a completely different pathway here. And so ARID1A is a tumor suppressor very much for in this type of colon cancer. And then paradoxically can actually be essential in the went beta catenin. So we asked the same question, what is the complex of ARID1A to switch NIF integrity? What we see is, well, not surprisingly, the ARID1A versions of the complex go away but the ARID1B versions of the complex remain there. And so we see quite a change, but ARID1B, which is more lowly expressed, remains intact, and now it goes from being dispensable to actually being essential in these cell lines. So in the loss of ARID1A, we now have a synthetic lethal with ARID1B, um, and we had published that in uh, Nature Medicine about two years ago, and I'm not gonna show that, but that also holds true in the colon cancer model. So what's the contribution to switch NIF targeting? Um, uh, Terry Magnuson's group, again, had looked at promoter occupancy for ARID1A. What we find really, again, is all about enhancers, and, and really starkly so. So this is looking at HCT116 colon cancer cell line with and without. So wild type, there were 3,051 3, sites called. If we knock out ARID1A, we see a pretty substantial reduction. And when we look here, what this is, this binding is enhancers, K4 mono with K27 acetyl, and the other binding is one of those two marks, and here are the K4 trimethyl. So we see very little binding at promoters here. And again, when we look at bindings of residual switch NIF complexes, a marked reduction, as we did with smart b one with the exception that we also see some novel gain of binding that we think are the ARID1B containing complexes. So similar but some distinct features depending on the subunit that is hit and is mutated. So what's the effect of ARID1A loss on the chromatin landscape upon enhancers and upon enhancer function? And so now we see something that's quite similar to what we saw with SMARC-B1. Maybe not quite as strong a reduction of SMARC-K4 and SMARC-C1. Again, no change in K4 mono. Now here's the reduction in K27 acetyl. Again, we see that in the loss of nucleosome free region. Here, less of an effect on K4 mono, but again, this nucleosome free region has been lost. So let's ask the same questions. What pathways are regulated? 
And again, we see the AP1 story with CTCF being relatively depleted. What are the downstream targets? Whether we look in primary mouse colon epithelium or whether we look in HCT116, again, it's development differentiation that are, are really seen there. And, you know, this, this comes through every single time, but I want to point out these p-values are not the type of p-values that really blow you away when you're looking at really large gene sets. And so there is a preference for development and differentiation, but again, many things being affected, and it's always hard to know with annotation. Um, so very widespread effects. You know, reviewers always want to know what's the target. And so I'll talk about that. So we get, you know, we ended up getting pushed into this. And so, you know, I point out more than a thousand genes were affected. Here's the example of the gastermins, which are known tumor suppressors in gastric epithelium. And so here's the K27 acetyl in wild type and in knockout. Here's the RNA-seq in wild type and in knockout. And so I want to be careful. I'm not making the claim that gas dermins are why this thing is a tumor suppressor. I'm making a claim. Here's an example of genes that are affected. These ones might be ones that could be relevant. But again, important to think about broad effects. So I want to move into some conclusions and then, and then some models and, and leave some time for, for questions. So SWCHNIF or BAF complex mutations are common in cancer. SMART B1 deficient human cancers contain remarkably few genetic uh, mutations suggesting a transcriptional mechanism by which SMART B1 loss promotes cancer. Inactivation of SMART B1 in mice leads to rapid onset of cancer, but from a highly restricted cell type. SWCHNIF complex binds predominantly at enhancers. So I think that's a new way to think about this. Loss of SMARC B1 destabilizes the switch NIF complex and, bind, and alters its binding to enhancers. SMARC B1 inactivation results in loss of active chromatin stated enhancers and impairs expression of genes involved in development differentiation. SMARC B1 expression leads to increased protein levels of enhancer. Uh, so turning it back on leads to increased enhancer P300 BRD4 mediator in chromatin fractions. Inactivation of the ARID1A subunit drives colon cancer in mice. Like SMARC B1, it targets the complex to enhancers, plays key role in enhancer function. Um, and coming back to this, you know, what is the target? And so I really want to think about this now. Um, so we have looked in human brain rhabdoid tumors, kidney rhabdoid tumors, mouse rhabdoid tumors, SMARC B1 deficient cell lines, ARID1A, Everything, we've used loss of function, gain of function, mouse modeling, RNA-seq, chip-seq, many tools, analytical. And what we have found is that the affected genes vary markedly by cell type, even for genetically and histologically indistinguishable rhabdoid tumors that come from different tissues. If we take ATRT brain cell lines and look at kidney cell lines and look for overlap, we very quickly get to a Venn diagram that either has nothing in it or makes no sense. And so what I've shown you till now is data that I'm pretty confident in. I'm now going to start moving into models and thinking about how do I interpret this. Um, and so I don't have as much confidence that I'm right about this, but it's a model of what do I think is going on. There may not be a key target across switch to function, but rather it may be a network effect at thousands of enhancers with the effect dependent upon cell type and the transcription factors that are present. So what do I mean by that? So looking at, at the model, what are the things that I pointed out? So only, we have to account for a model where only a few very highly select cell types are transformed following SMARC-B1 mutation. These may be cells that are highly proliferative, such as memory T cells, Okay, so here's speculation. You know, memory T cells, incredibly proliferative when they're given antigen. And in fact, if we transplant those lymphoma cells into wild-type mice, they grow great. But if we put them in a class 1 deficient KBDB class 1 deficient mouse where they don't have TCR MHC engagement, they won't grow. So this is really, we think, about unlocking this intrinsically highly proliferative state. Those are the susceptible guys. Super enhancer function is maintained. So what's been shown about super enhancers is that they are important for remembering what our current cell state is. So now if you have a highly proliferative cell type, 
your super enhancers are locked in, you remember we're a highly proliferative cell type. In normal development, how do cells get out of that? They do that for a while, then they differentiate. How do they differentiate? They grab an enhancer. They turn on an enhancer that expresses lineage-specific differentiation factors, and they differentiate. But in the absence of smart b one enhancer function of typical enhancers is impaired, thus precluding differentiation. So this is the speculative model, then, that in the absence of smart b one if you, you know, actually, it's important to point out, if we inactivate smart b one in almost any other cell type, we don't get cancer. We get cell death. We have never been able to save a fibroblast in which we've deleted smart b one We knock out P53, knock out RB, add MYC, add RAS. We can't save it. It is only this highly specific cell type. You lose this function. Your super enhancers are maintained. You lose the ability to differentiate, and now you're stuck in this proliferative state. So, so that becomes the model. And then we think about, well, coming back to our question of how does one intervene? And so this is a figure that we did a number of years ago. Um, you know, so here's the switch NIFT complex showing two different varieties of it. Here's its activity on, on chromatin, and here are some downstream targets. And so, uh, you know, one possibility is to look at downstream targets. And, you know, Novartis is interested in, and other companies in CDK4 inhibition, which is now in phase one clinical trials. I'm showing six pathways here. I think I've driven home that many pathways are affected. And so it makes me nervous going down to a single downstream target in are the cancer cells going to effectively just dance around this. Can we actually, though, move on to the level of chromatin? And so what we have is loss of a gene. It's missing, so we can't target it directly. It's affecting thousands of, of targets, but it's doing so in sort of choreographed dance with other chromatin regulatory complexes. Can we target those? And so Epizyme and other companies are now going after this in a clinical trial. And I think it's just simply too early to know. There have been a couple teasers, and we'll just have to say, see, I don't think the polycomb and switch NIF complex are directly a yin and yang that were evolutionarily developed to antagonize each other. I think the switch NIF complex is generally a transcriptional activator. The polycomb complex is generally a transcriptional repressor. They will fight over genes that are dynamically regulated. And so this may be an opportunity to go after things therapeutically too early to know um, whether that's gonna, gonna work. Can we actually do something a bit crazy or heretical and think about targeting the residual switch NIF complex? And I didn't take much time to show you this data, a little bit with ARID1A and ARID1B, but what we have found is in nearly all the places we have looked is that switch NIF mutant cancers are dependent upon the residual aberrant switch NIF complex for survival. So while this is a tumor suppressor loss, meaning a genetic meets all the criteria, genetic loss of the tumor suppressor, the residual aberrant complex is still important for the survival of these cancers, at least in the vast majority of cases. So can one actually think about targeting these complexes? Um, the bromo domains that are present, have, it turns out by work both by Bradner Lab and a number of pharma companies from genetic models and targeting, no effect. So it's probably, the guess is there are so many bromo domains in this complex, one subunit actually contains six bromo domains of its own, um, that that's not enough. On the other hand, the ATPA subunits are essential, and so there's a number of companies that are going after the ATPase. And essentially, you're gonna need these molecules. I can't tell you yet whether this is the best target to go after or the absolutely worst target to go after because these are a tumor suppressor complex and could you cause cancer. In all of the cases that have been caused by this, adding the subunit back tends to block those cancers, and so it may be that stopping any therapy would reverse anything. But again, you know, I think things that are worth thinking about mechanistically in the lab, considering whether that could have impact in the clinic. Um, so I've tried to acknowledge the people who did the work. Xiaofeng Wang is now um, on the job market, um, just a spectacular postdoc. Um, Radhika, he led the um, SMART-B1 work in uh, the recent publications. Radhika led the, the ARID1A. Um, she's also beginning to look for postdocs. Um, important collaborations with Peter Park's lab at HMS. They're professional computational biologists, and so really do all of our computational work in collaboration with them. Um, with ARID1A, we collaborated with Ramesh Shiv Dasani's lab at um, Dana-Farber, who's interested in GI development. 
Stu Orkin's lab with the EZH2 um, provided us with the EZH2 knockout mice and the compound in collaboration. I really should have Lauren Walensky's lab here for the peptide um, that inhibits EZH2. Project Achilles, uh, Bill Hahn, Levi Garraway, the Broad Institute, um, a number of collaborations here and funding, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. So the uh, P300 we looked at because P300, two reasons. One, it had been previously shown in papers a couple of years ago that it could interact with the SwitchNIF complex, and so we paid attention to that. And it is, um, along with CBP, the acetyltransferase that works at uh, K27. And so that's where we saw the even stronger activity. And so as, you know, as we were working on K27 trimethyl with the SwitchNIF complex, we would see changes not always as strong, and once we got onto K27 to settle, that's where we just really see strong changes. Uh, and so that's where we think the tightest link is to switch NIF function. So we think that's the closest, and then the, the changes with EZH2 are then happening um, indirectly in, in terms of these complexes fighting over enhancers for regulation of cell phase. Yes. So the question is, um, is it a tumor suppressor or an oncogene um, is one question. The answer to that one is yes. Uh, I'll return to that in a second. And the other is, how can this possibly be a tumor suppressor gene if you're having widespread effects on enhancers? Um, and so let me take the second question first, and I'll return to whether it's tumor suppressor or oncogene. So what we really think, and this is why we're moving into the model speculation, is Actually, an important point, as we look at gene expression changes when we knock out SMARC-B1 subunit, with transcription factor knockouts, you often will get tenfold, twentyfold, you know, fifty-fold, seventy-fold changes, and those are essentially going from off to on. When we look at the gene, the transcriptional changes that occur with switch NIF mutations, we see twofold, threefold. These things we think are really about fine-tuning, that a lot of the information is coming from the transcription factors, and these guys are facilitators. And so as we see these changes, we also think that, and the model becomes, when do you need this complex? If a gene is always on or always off, you don't really need the switch NIF complex because it's not about, you know, the nucleosomes get moved at some point and it's, and it's not going on. It's really during dynamic changes. And when is dynamic change? Well, that's development. That's also signaling. That's growth factors that come on. That is the cell changing fates. That's when you need to change things, and we think that's what's going on, and so that's why we are seeing development differentiation. And presumably, if we worked with growth factors and signaling, we would also see those changes. And the transcriptional effects are there, but they're modest. And so that's what we think is happening is really, I don't think these complexes were evolutionarily selected as tumor suppressors. I think these complexes were evolutionarily selected as transcriptional facilitators. And if you mess with them in just the wrong cell type, cancer can be the outcome. Messing with them in the vast majority of cells does not lead to cancer. So now your, question, your first question was, are these tumor suppressors or oncogenes? And I said yes. And the reason I said that is I used to think of them you know, as fair, you know, the yin and yang, tumor suppressors and oncogenes as being opposites. I actually think it's like love and hate. They're not really opposites. Um, love and indifference are opposites. And, and things can switch back and forth. And so EZH2 is a great example of this. There are real loss of function mutations of EZH2 in human cancer, and there are truly gain of function mutations of EZH2 in cancer. So I start to think about that and say, well, maybe in some cell types, too much silencing is the wrong way to go. Other cell types, too much activation is the wrong way to go, and it's just about context. It's actually true about P53. For you know, we've, P53, when it was originally cloned, was thought to be an oncogene, then quickly flipped into this tumor suppressor. 
but there's plenty of data out there that there are missense gain of function mutations in p53. So p53 can really be an oncogene or a tumor suppressor. And so if we come to the switch NIF complex, by and large, this really looks to be a tumor suppressor complex. Um, but Segal's data on EZH2 and synovial sarcoma now looks to be a gain of function phenotype in terms of EZH2 displacement. And so synovial sarcoma may be a switch NIF mutation that is oncogenic with respect to polycomb loss and is um, hyperdisplacement of EZH2, whereas rhabdoid tumors are tumor suppressor loss. And so it's going to be context. You know, the type of each subunit of the switch NIF complex has a different cancer-associated spectrum. So each of them are, there's some overlap. Each of them are subtly different. So it's going to be context, context in terms of, I think, what's, what's going on. Yeah, so it's a great question, and there's a, it triggers a number of things in my mind. So it turns out that germline mutations of a number of switch sniff subunits lead to neurodevelopmental disorders, particularly coffin serous syndrome or nicolaides baretzer syndrome. So there's these, these are, homo, these are sorry, heterozygous mutations. Some of them can be point mutations, some of them can be lost. So there's your neurodevelopment. Turns out that familial schwannomatosis is also a smart B1 loss. It's at later in life, in meaning teenagers, it's actually a pretty benign tumor spectrum, so not nearly the aggressive nature of the rhabdoid ones. If we turn off smart b one in bone marrow, we wipe it out. If we turn it off in liver, we wipe the liver out. So there's very potent effects. Now, something that really caught me by surprise that I didn't mention here. So basically, wherever we turned off smart b one we would essentially decimate that organ, except for mature T cells that are not cycling. And those can, you give them BRDU, they can last a long time if they're just being pycnotic cells. They can get by without it. So we go to the ARID1A model, and we knock it out first with MX Cree, and then we returned with um, a Cree expressed only in the intestines. It turns out you can have a completely normal intestine without ARID1A. So these intestines, we, we did the immunohistochemistry, ARID1A is gone, and they look completely normal and yet they are susceptible to getting colon cancer. So again, if it's a part-time subunit, relatively modest effect. If it's a full-time core subunit, devastating effect. Context dependence, you can get neurodevelopmental, you can get a benign tumor onset, you can get a cancer onset. So yes, I think that these things are transcriptional facilitators and other things could well be linked to them depending on where you, where you hit them. I, I guess I would say, you know, also, as people pull transcription factors, it's just not surprising to me that the switch NIF complex comes along. If you're IPing a transcription factor, it shouldn't be surprising that you pull switch NIF. If we pull switch NIF, we never see transcription factors. And the answer to that is, I think it's just one of stoichiometry, that any given transcription factor is very rare. And so therefore, we don't see it in mass spec. But it's pretty common to see it. And so again, context. OK, I think we're at time. Uh, thank you all. <laughs>